In times of hardship, such as our current global crisis, people scour the horizons for glimmers of hope. Some view faith like infrared goggles, some sort of advanced technology that enables a person to detect hope. Where no one else can see, the person of faith perceives hope. Land ho, there it is, hope. This seems a reasonable expectation of faith. If it can't bring hope, what good is it? Yet this is a misunderstanding, a misapplication of faith. Faith is not a technology that shortcuts us from suffering straight to hope. Faith, hope, and love, of course, these three cornerstones anchor the Christian life. Yet when the Apostle Paul talks about these three in the context of hardship, he's very clear about the place of each. Listen to Paul's words from his letter to the Christians at Rome. Uh, this is in Romans chapter 5. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand. And we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. Faith is the starting point in our new life. And God's love provides us the assurance. It's poured into our hearts. And in the midst, we live by hope. But neither faith nor love shortcuts the path from hardship to hope. How did Paul put it? He said this. He said, suffering produces endurance. Endurance produces character. Character produces hope. So between the hardship and the hope, there's endurance, the, the holding on. And then this thing Paul calls character. So, what is, what is character? Well, you might hear your mom talk about your cousin's new boyfriend. Ah, he's quite a character. Meaning, perhaps, that he got everyone balancing pickles on toothpicks at your aunt's Thanksgiving dinner. In other words, a person with character possesses a certain broke-the-mold confidence. They know their part, and they grab life in a way that engages and annoys. <laughs> We laugh with and we love these big characters, though we may not want to live with them. But that's character as in personality. That's not what Paul's talking about here. It's not our uniquely created individuality that arrives here between endurance and hope, but something else, something that's rare, but can be had by any one of us. Character might be described as a sort of weathered calm, a strength that may have lost its shine, but for that seems all the stronger. Character. I think I know you know what I mean, but maybe we don't. We live in a culture that loves and praises all things shiny, and as if we were magpies. We like what's new and fresh. What's latest is greatest. All those pretty young things. What's weathered might be antique or trendy retro. But when that particular fad for retro fades, it's like, ooh, what's this? And off we go. We, we praise the fresh innocence of youth, believing it's always best the first time around. We place little stock in the barnacled old tug that has barged its way through storms beyond count. We don't often value weathered wisdom or tried strength. Our technological society places great faith in a coming solution. The future is now. So Paul's words come to us strange. What is this that comes between hardship and hope? this character. Paul's word refers to the quality of being approved. Our factories, they stamp their products, tested and approved, quality assured. 
and we assume people are the same, that human beings arrive in the world fresh out of the box with their quality assured, and all time does is wear us out and cause us to fall apart. We're wrong about this. Life is our factory. You and I, are, we're being made. Character, the quality of being tested and approved, is not something you're born with. It's given and gained. You don't start with it. You might finish with it. It's not found, but formed and fashioned. It's tempered like steel. Refine like gold. In the weeks ahead, we want to explore this thing called character that God desires to form in you and in me in a time when we're more aware of hardship, in a time when we're looking for hope. I hope this conversation might help us resist our culture of the shiny and say no to the false view that faith should give us a shortcut and instead re-engage this lost notion of character as that which has been tested and approved. So, this morning then, one or two further thoughts of introduction, and then we're going to touch briefly on one facet of true character. Pause with me, though, and let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you. Thank you that you long to shape us and mold us in your likeness, to change us, to transform us. And so this morning we ask that by your word and by your spirit, you'd be at work in us. Amen. Well, it's another writer of the New Testament, the Apostle James. And he begins his letter tracing out the same path as Paul. He says this in James chapter 1, uh, starting in verse 2. My brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of any kind, consider it nothing but joy, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its full effect, so that you may be mature and complete, lacking in nothing. Then in verse 12, Blessed is anyone who endures trials. Such a one has stood the test and will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. James 2 starts from faith, and he gets to the hope of life and love, but he doesn't seem to mention character. However, he talks about testing and having stood the test which are simply verbal forms of Paul's word character, which means tested and approved. So when hardship, trials come, and the testing happens, character is being formed. So that, in James' words, we may be mature and complete, lacking in nothing. Now Paul had suggested that we can boast in suffering, like get pumped might be a good way to say it, James, instead, encourages us to consider hardships of any kind as nothing but joy. Nothing but joy? Really? It's important to note what Paul and James are not saying. They're not promoting masochism, some delight in pain for pain's sake. Nor do they ever say that suffering is meritorious in itself, like you get marks from God if you suffer. That would make God into some kind of sadist. God does not delight in pain. He weeps over sickness and sin, abuse and disease, disaster and war. These were not part of the world as God created it, nor will they be part of the world he's remaking. But now, in this broken world, God can redeem trials of any kind and form something beautiful from them. Character. That quality of being tested and approved. He himself, after all, did not avoid suffering and hardship, but Jesus too endured alongside us. And now because of our faith in this Jesus risen from the dead, we can get pumped when we face trials of any kind, knowing that God is busy making all things well, including me. 
David Brooks, a New York Times columnist and author, in his book, The Road to Character, laments our culture's abandonment of character as a worthwhile aim for one's life. With some pretty great storytelling, Brooks emphasizes how character forms amid what he calls moral struggle. Here's how Brooks puts it. He says, character is built in the course of your own inner con confrontation. Character is a set of dispositions, desires, and habits that are slowly engraved during the struggle against your own weakness. This is one of James's trials of any kind, the moral struggle, the battle against sin in our own hearts. But hardship comes for each of us in many forms, and none are good in and of themselves. But between suffering and hope, God by his Spirit can form character that we might be mature and complete, possessing that weathered calm, that barnacled strength. Character we might also compare to a, a cut diamond, to a gem with many facets, reflecting light here and now here. Since ancient times, humans have attempted to describe these facets of character. Greek philosophers, for example, enumerated four cardinal virtues that mark true character. It was courage, or fortitude, moderation, or temperance, and then wisdom and justice. Plato, for one, saw justice as the one virtue that kind of brings the rest together. In the Hebrew and Christian scriptures, however, the overarching virtue is wisdom. We might go so far to say that in the Bible, wisdom is just another word for, or a synonym for character. Which makes it fascinating to read on in James's letter. Right after he talks about the person of character being someone lacking in nothing, he says this. He says, if any of you is lacking in wisdom, ask God, who gives to all generously and ungrudgingly, and it will be given you. See, if there's one thing that suffering teaches us, it's our limitations. When I was young, I knew a lot more than I do today. Having been through a few things, some hard, I've slowly come to know how rarely I know, how often I am lacking in wisdom. Knowing I don't know should make me ready to ask. The irony of wisdom, of character, is this. Being mature and complete, lacking in nothing, means you realize your own lack. Character is simply a growing humility, a growing readiness to ask for wisdom, for help. The good news, which James is quick to remind us, is that God is happy to give, generously and ungrudgingly. God is never stingy with this gift called wisdom. You and I just need to ask. The opening chapters of a book called Proverbs in the Hebrew Bible makes the same point, speaking particularly to those who are young. Listen to these words from Proverbs chapter 2, starting in verse 3. If you indeed cry out for insight and raise your voice for understanding, if you seek it like silver and search for it as for hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. Seek it. Cry out for it. Wisdom is not a human achievement. It's a gift from God. Now, like all the facets of this gem called character, God gives it to us through life, through circumstance. Proverbs talks often about the concept of discipline, not as in punishment, but discipline as in what makes a disciple. Think of Mr. Miyagi and the Karate Kid, the training program. God uses everything that comes our way, including hardships, to discipline us, to get us into shape. Listen to these words of encouragement. Again, in Proverbs, My child, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be weary of his reproof. 
For the Lord reproves the one he loves, as a father the son in whom he delights. Whoever loves discipline loves knowledge, but those who hate to be rebuked are stupid. God, in his unbelievable love for us, schools us. If we ask, this is how his generous gift will arrive. It will be training through life. Because it's the only way to give us wisdom or character. It's the only way because wisdom isn't book learning. The Jesus shape of true wisdom is this. Jesus isn't a philosopher. He's not content with abstract concepts. Later in James's letter, he asks this. James chapter 3, verse 13. He says, Who is wise and understanding among you? Show by your good life that your works are done with gentleness, born of wisdom. Wise is as wise does. Not wise is as wise says or thinks or writes or blogs or posts. Wisdom is forged in the fires of circumstance. And then it's lived out in new circumstances. Until that's the case, wisdom has not yet arrived. Character is as yet unformed. James points out that the actions of true wisdom are marked by gentleness, or more literally, a meekness. Jesus had said, the meek are blessed. Wisdom, Jesus' way, is meek. It's a willingness to accept correction. It's a willingness to receive wisdom as a gift. It's a willingness to admit what it doesn't know. Paul says that knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Human so-called wisdom serves the self. Look what I know. True wisdom serves humbly and blesses others in love. The bounce back is even more blessing. Again, in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 13, it says this, Happy are those who find wisdom and those who get understanding. For her income is better than silver and her revenue better than gold. She's more precious than jewels, and nothing you desire can compare with her. Long life is in her right hand, and in her left hand are riches and honor. Her ways are ways of pleasantness, and all her paths are peace. She's a tree of life to those who lay hold of her. Those who hold her fast are called happy. She's a tree of life. In the very beginning, God created us to eat from a tree of life in the garden. And at the end of the story of Scripture, we find again that tree of life, fruitful in the new earth. So we might say that wisdom is a taste of heaven. Wisdom is what we're meant for. So, are you, am I, chasing after wisdom, asking God for this tree of life called wisdom or character? James later goes on to describe the other facets of the jewel as he sees them. He says this, The wisdom that comes down from above is first pure and peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace for those who make peace. In the weeks ahead, we're going to take James's words here and we're going to explore these other facets or virtues, these marks of being tested and approved. But for now, I want you to imagine. Imagine a sort of scale or line here in front of me. And at one end might be the person who, with everything they got, is pursuing true Jesus-shaped character. Their, their regular prayer is this, God, reshape me into something tested and approved because you love me and rescued me. At the other end, maybe we find the person who spends little time thinking about the notion of character. They're focused on getting through, on getting the best of each and every moment. Now, I invite you to place yourself on that line. Where are you at? probably put myself maybe this side of middle a little bit. Maybe you're here. Maybe you're here. But now, a second question. A more important question. What's keeping me from being closer to this end? 
Maybe I'm overwhelmed by my hardships, my struggles, moral or otherwise. Maybe I'm consumed with a sense of my own inadequacy. Uh, who am I? <laughs> who am I to have character, to receive this gift from God? Or perhaps I'm just caught in short-term thinking, always hoping for a quick fix, unwilling for the long track of character formation. Well, here's the good news. There are no special qualifications to move toward this end. There's no specific personality or status or gifts or abilities. Only a willingness to ask. Say, God, give me the wisdom that I lack. A willingness to look to God to give me the endurance that I need. And to believe that God is not stingy. On the cross, we see Jesus. He shows us that God is not stingy in sharing himself with us. So go ahead. Ask God for wisdom in your hardships and always. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you. Thank you for the great gift of Jesus, and that through Jesus, we have been offered the gift of your Spirit, and your Spirit's work is to form in us the character that we're meant to have, this tested and approved, weathered calm. So Lord, as we reflect on our desire for character, our desire for wisdom, our pursuit of it. Speak to us. Be at work in my heart. Draw me to long for this tree of life that you give generously to us. Thank you for your patience with us. Thank you for the model of Jesus who endured. Thank you for your love. We pray this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Amen. So this week, let's put our eyes on the long track. The long track of becoming tested and approved. We don't need no shortcuts. Let's trust that even in hardship, character is being formed. And that together we're on the way to a hope that does not disappoint.